The talk will be given by Rob and is entitled Exploring the Corona Outbreak with R. Okay, cool. So I think um, I'm going uh, to start with two um, sort of apologies. Um, the one is this is not going to be an, uh, an empathetic talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about the data, I'm going to talk about the numbers, I'm going to talk about how we can analyze them. This doesn't mean I'm not sympathetic to the situation or anything else. Uh, I'm just trying to be matter of fact about it and just take some of the emotion out. Um, the second thing is uh, I will often mix up, I will say, the coronavirus instead of its te technical name, which is COVID-19. Um, TikTok taught me in the last two weeks that I'm allowed to call it the corona, and everyone will just understand what I mean. <laughs> so if you have a TikTok addiction like me, you'll, you'll, you'll sympathize. Okay, cool. And yeah, my name's Rob. Um, so uh, yeah, I think uh, just an overview of this talk. Um, I'm going to give you my personal curiosity timeline. Um, I, I don't work in this field. I'm not a medical practitioner. Um, but I do identify as a mathematician slash data science slash whatever hodgepodge you'd like to call yourself. Um, and as a result, uh, I, I feel uh, well equipped. I've got R. I can analyze this stuff for myself. There's a lot of fake news out there. And I'd like to make sure that the information that I'm looking at has been vetted by me, right? I, I trust no one. Um, so, uh, some COVID-19 information. Um, I attended a couple of nice talks, and I'm going to share some information with you on that from a sort of more medical standpoint, but I'm not the authority on that. Uh, a little bit of R, almost no R. I'm not going to show you any R. I'm going to show you the output of R uh, and some visualizations and then some better uh, visualizations. Um, I originally promised in my abstract I would do some simulation, but unfortunately, we're not just not going to have time. There's so much interesting stuff in this data set. Once you start to dig into it, you, you'll see we're, we're going to go over by at least a minute. Just a minute. Um, okay, because I know like no one really wants to hear about this, right? Uh, <laughs> okay, cool. So on the 22nd of January, uh, a friend of mine sent me a WhatsApp um, to a dashboard tracker, um, and I opened it on my phone, um, as many of us do when you're sort of absentmindedly doing something arbitrary, and I saw that there were 555 cases, took one look at this, and I was just like, meh, this is lame, closed it, uh, and carried on with my day, went for a haircut. Um, I know this because uh, I had a conversation about it. Anyway, but then on the 25th of Jan, I received another link from a different friend who said, wow, dude, you really got to check out this dashboard. Open the dashboard, same bloody dashboard, but my brain had remembered the number, and I knew that because I'd had a haircut when I last saw this thing, that just three days prior, this number was at 555. So in three days to go from 555 to 1500, I was like, ah, so the little uh, light bulb in my head went off and went, ah, this is not linear growth, this is something scarier. So I was like, cool, uh, uh, let me get involved. So I started looking for the data and playing around. Uh, and this is the John Hopkins dashboard. Um, which, uh, you see it on CNN all the time, people are like putting this thing up everywhere. It is 90% uh, useless in terms of how to use real estate in this world. Um, this is not a good way to represent information. I say this in the nicest way. The John Hopkins people are doing great, um, a great work actually curating the data. I'm going to show you a different way to show exactly the same information and actually get a little bit of insight out of what's going on. I mean, honestly, who can look there in the center of China and tell me how, how has the output progressed over time? Really, I mean, it's, it's, and that's your, your whole center focus of the chart. Uh, so Saturday Day talk submissions came around on the 10th of February, sitting at 4,200 cases, and I thought, oh, sorry, 42,000 cases. I thought, why the hell not? Let's do it. Um, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll take the plunge and put together a talk I'm not an expert on. Uh, and then, uh, so a couple of days later, I thought, equip yourself. I went to a talk by Prof. Vardis. She's the head of uh, Lancet Labs at the NICD uh, at Norton Rose Fulbright, and she gave sort of like a medical breakdown of the interpretation of the virus, uh, yeah, Prof. Artists, lots of clinical information. I'm going to relay really at a super high level, um, it, it's, and this is it. Okay, so uh, it, when they talk about um, uh, sort of modeling diseases and outbreaks, there's this number called the R0 number. Uh, it is effectively the number of people on average that one sick person is going to infect over the, the duration of the, the outbreak. Um, and so COVID-19 lies down here, and this was uh, directly from her talk, um, at a value of about 2.2. And you can see where that sits relative to hep C, Ebola, SARS, HIV, mumps, measles being the, the real killer here. Um, I've seen a couple of charts trying to convey this data with like bubble charts and whatnot, but really sometimes a, this kind of chart is just the best way to do it because you can really see the relative difference between, these, uh, between the R0 values. So apparently not that contagious. R0 of 2.2, pretty low. Okay, so we, we can just accept this and move on with life. Oh, I put this just here at the bottom. I'm going to leave references, little footnotes at the bottom of my slides. Um, just... Uh, if you've ever worked in R Markdown, sometimes they have a background that's got like a different blended thing, and you want to make your whole GG plot transparent. Uh, this just has a 10 line code statement, throw it at the top of your LaTeX file, and all your plots blend magically. It's just super useful if you're pedantic about having like nice edging. Um, so case fatality rates for COVID-19, it sits here in the middle. This is a log scale, don't be, don't be confused. Um, so bubonic plague, plague and HIV, if gone untreated, um, those are like 100%. That, that will kill you. Um, SARS sits at about 10%. That was the big outbreak that happened a while ago. 
uh, and I say big in relative terms. Chickenpox, seasonal flu, uh, you know, they're not even on the spectrum. They're not even playing the game, guys. Um, they're not. Um, so yeah, the Spanish flu, um, that's H1N1, um, also known now as uh, swine flu, uh, very similar to, uh, in terms of the R0 value, but not so similar in terms of case fatality rate, right? So these are interesting things to know, just to put it in context. Uh, COVID-19, I'm going to state pretty confidently, it comes from the, the meat market. It's, uh, it's a transfer from bats. There was a paper earlier on in January of last year that was published by, oddly enough, the Wuhan um, uh, Institute of some medical technology, basically citing exactly, they'd observed the kind of transfer of these coronaviruses from such animals. Uh, and this is just an example. You can order pretty much anything in China at a, at a wet market. So that's obviously not cool by our social standards. Um, cool, so from a clinical assessment point of view, um, on the left are uh, day eight lungs. Um, so uh, what does the coronavirus actually do to you in the sort of uh, more serious onset cases? Uh, you can clearly make out the lungs on the left. You can see the shape of the lungs. Uh, on the right-hand side over here, you can see that the lungs are all fuzzy. Uh, and in x-ray, this means there's matter or something there. And uh, effectively, what's happening is your lungs are filling up with fluid, uh, and you drown. Okay, so this is quite unpleasant. I hope it doesn't happen to anyone. Okay, uh, coronavirus is actually very common. They're a class of virus. Um, these top four over here are basically the common cold. They get named after the country in which they first discovered. So HK Hong Kong, NL uh, Netherlands. Um, the current coronavirus is not named CH or WU. Uh, for political reasons. It's just called the novel coronavirus or something else. Uh, let's not dive too deeply into that. Um, so SARS, uh, was, uh, the SARS was a coronavirus. It is of the family of coronavirus. Um, and MERS is also of the coronavirus. So the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome is the deadliest of the coronaviruses. Your fatality rate there is 30%. Um, that is, that's quite scary. And that's ongoing. That's still happening in the Middle East. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about SARS. The numbers for SARS are really easy to remember. Uh, the outbreak lasted eight months. 8,000 people got infected, 800 people died. Okay, so it's the, the three eights. You, you can't go wrong. SARS is super simple. Um, but it lasted eight months, right? And 8,000 cases in eight months, we're like, oh, okay, cool. So I had a little celebration at the office when on the 20, what's the, uh, the 1st of Feb, thereabouts, uh, the coronavirus exceeded the, the number of cases for SARS. Just because if you look at the time scale, this is about uh, six weeks versus eight months, uh, and we've reached the same kind of infection, right, uh, spread. So uh, in terms of modeling assumptions, is R0, R, your R0 value of 2.2 correct, being so close to the SARS value? Probs not. Um, this, is, uh, yeah, this is behaving quite differently in terms of its contagiousness, right? So we're going to get into some reasons around that. Uh, but fortunately, recovery rate's very good. Um, the recovery rate's kind of useless to us, um, if we're being honest, because what happens is, is this relies on people coming back and reporting to the medical practitioners that they have recovered from the virus. Who wants to go back to a hospital where there's lots of sick people? Um, none of us, right? So even though you might have built up some natural immunity to it, no one's going no to roll that dice. Um, so not more than once anyway. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, the, what is interesting though is the mortality rate, um, so the, the number of people that have died. And because of this John Hopkins tra um, tracker, the mortality rate's been bandied about quite aggressively in, in the sort of like media and everything, and everyone's been watching it very closely. Uh, you can get the data from uh, the John Hopkins tra uh, DACA, trash uh, DACA trash board. <laughs> tra <laughs> tra tra tracking dashboard, let's call it that. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll slip over a few more words before this presentation is done. Um, I call this tidy tears. Um, this makes me want to weep uh, because the data comes in neither long nor wide form. It's kind of somewhere in the middle, right? Um, this is not a good way to store, manage, or curate time series data. Um, it's not fair on the public. Um, so if you're ever in a position where you're the creator of such data, please don't just make it long, and then everyone can work with it. Um, so uh, yeah, we, but uh, fortunately we've got uh, TidyR. We can clean it up and put it in long form and actually work with it. Um, and this is where we stand now. So I updated this uh, this morning, uh, actually mid-morning, uh, around 12 o'clock, I was sitting at the back, did a quick update. If anything's broken in this presentation, that's why. I haven't actually, we are all seeing this presentation together for the first time now because uh, <laughs> I, I did it in R Markdown and I had a Markdown script. It worked yesterday, surely it'll work today. Okay, so now you can kind of see, since Feb to now, a month later, right, where we just passed that, that SARS line, where we kind of stand now. So this is eclipsing SARS in terms of its ability to be contagious and, and to spread. So this is pretty obvious from the data. You don't have to be a medical person or, or suitably qualified. The, the numbers speak for themselves. Okay, so let's talk about the mortality rates. Um, we've got this great tracking dashboard. We can do what uh, everyone else does, where they just take the um, current number of infected people, divide by the number of people that have died, and we can see uh, what the mortality rate is, right? Sure, easy. Everyone does it in the media, uh, and that's, that's what's been happening. 
But if you look at the mortality rate, it's been changing over time, which is pretty weird when you think about it, right? It's not like the disease is in the beginning of its infancy stages trying to be incognito and killing less people. Like, obviously, the, the mortality rate, you would expect it to be consistent, a horizontal line, and it's not. So that's, that's pretty weird. Um, the other thing that people say is that China have been understating uh, their mortality rates um, because reason X, Y, Z, I don't know, insert conspiracy theory here. Um, they haven't. If you split the data onto uh, the Chinese data and data from everywhere else in the world, actually China's got a higher mortality rate. So now we've got to ask, okay, do, uh, China have, uh, do Asia as a whole have a higher level of aged population? Because uh, we know, <laughs> uh, I've been trying to work out a way to rationalize, um, <clears throat> was this concocted in a lab as a weapon of bio-warfare? Um, this doesn't make any sense either. Who would construct a weapon of uh, bio-warfare that is so ageist? Um, your, your mortality rate in elderly people, anyone above 70, your mortality rate is about 85%. Uh, so cool, you're, you're, ta you're targeting the elderly, you're not targeting the, the young and healthy that are able to fight in a war, like really think about it. Well, whoever did, did a really bad job, if that was the case. So yeah, incredibly unlikely when you look at the characteristics of the virus, right? So let's put the conspiracy theory to one side, doesn't really make sense. What does make sense, what, just looking at the data, is one could maybe argue, okay, what are the factors in China that you don't see anywhere else in the world? Incredibly high levels of pollution, uh, respiratory diseases, uh, pre-morbidity or, or pre-exposure to uh, effectively allowing the virus to be more effective. Right? So, um, yeah, these are things to think about. These mortality rates are a complete and utter fail. Um, they are computed incorrectly um, because I've done it intentionally to show you why uh, last week, uh, the WHO, or this last week, I think on Tuesday, they revised the estimates for the mortality rate up to 3.6, which is still incorrect, uh, and I'll show you why. Um, when you are measuring uh, mortality rates, uh, uh, let me give this with an example. I'm just going to show you the confirmed uh, versus the, the number of deaths. I'm going to put it on a log scale so we can just accentuate the impact here. So let's say for a moment, if I could magically click my fingers, right, and no new people get infected, right, uh, from the virus. What happens in the next couple of days to those that are currently infected? They die. Uh, well, not all, obviously, just some portion, some percentage of them pass away, right? So what's happening, though, is that your, your relationship between when you die is actually related to when you were first diagnosed as being infected, not the point at which you die. So what happened is in the beginning of the outbreak, the, the virus spread really, really rapidly, exponentially, and it masked the actual mortality rate because people are taking the top line and dividing it by the bottom line. So what you should be doing instead is tracking back to, well, what's the average time until you pass away? What cohorts do you belong to that you originally diagnosed in uh, and measure it to that total over there? And so you can see, if you just look at this top, okay, obviously we don't know this, the, the length of this line over here. We're going to work it out in a moment. But if you just look at that top section over there, you can see that's quite flat. And that's why the mortality rates have been catching up, is because China's been containing the outbreak. And so by flattening out the number of new infections, the mortalities from the previous cohorts have caught up, and we end up accidentally reporting on the rates correctly, and the WHO stated as a success. Uh, but actually, it was just a math fail. Um, because if you look back here, um, you can see that gap on the red line at the top there is very pronounced, right? That's, that's a very big gap. Oh, okay, cool. So we would have misreported the mortality rate at that point in time quite heavily. So the question is, can we work out that question mark over there? Yes, we can. We've got R. Uh, effectively, what we do is we say, well, we don't really know what that number is, but we know that the disease is going to be unbiased as to when, um, you know, the, the mortality rate. So we're actually looking for the flattest curve that we would get using all of those adjustment time periods there. Um, so what we have to do is smooth out the data. There was a change in reporting standards on the 11th or 12th of uh, Feb. We're going to get rid of these knots, smooth it out, uh, and smooth out the mortality rates as well. Uh, this, sorry, the spline function in R is just super awesome. It's in base R. It's there whether you want it or not. It's great. Um, and uh, we can just uh, we can plot out all of the curves. So we can look at the back lag, and we can do we actually get two things from this very simple um, diagrammatic sort of interpretation. The one is, uh, wherever there's a gradient up, okay, we're underestimating. Wherever there's a gradient down, we're overestimating. We're looking for where the porridge is just right, so flat in the middle, and we end up with a beautiful number of 3.7% uh, and a five-day mortality lag. Okay, so we have two, and, and that's just really just visual inspection of the data. That's not super complicated. Okay, uh, so then I thought, oh, I've got to visualize this data. So I did the Mungo plot of putting a whole bunch of dots on the map. Um, uh, it's really easy to do in SF, so you feel tempted to do it or obliged to do it. Uh, I learned nothing from this plot, so what I did was I did another more complicated plot. I did an entire animation. I thought, yeah, I want to see how this thing is breaking out. I sent it to all my friends. I'm like, ah, oh, this is the current state of the outbreak. Realized they weren't learning anything either. Um, all that we were doing was looking at a big dot on a map, which is Wuhan, and I know exactly where Wuhan is now, and that's about <laughs> it. Okay. So can we do better? The answer is yes. Uh, we've got to do a couple of things. Drop the geography, rather focus on countries, regions, provinces, focus on top elements, maybe scale the totals logarithmically, don't look at it linearly. 
uh, and get it all onto an axis. We need to encapsulate what's happening over time here. So I did this, um, and I'm a big fan now of D3, um, and this is embedded D3 uh, in R, um, so uh, uh, let's start. Uh, this is effectively all the Chinese provinces, and what we can do now is we can see, okay, up here, this is Hubei, this is the province where Wuhan is, this is the region that's most affected, uh, we've got a logarithmic scale on this side over here, and what we can do is we can interrogate all of the different cities, um, or all the different provinces across China, and see what the status is of their outbreak, right? But what you can see here is one typical general trend that pops out the moment you start to look at how all of these curves are behaving, it's all really, really, really similar. And that's because the Chinese implemented a lockdown at about the same date across all those provinces. Um, what does this mean? Okay, so now that we're seeing the impact and the slowdown and the spread of the disease, that's why now the mortality rate is corrected and everything's caught up. Cool, plot number one. Let's look at the rest of the world. Um, so I now what I've done is I've grouped all of the Chinese provinces into this top line over here. Let's play the guessing game. Uh, so we're up to 80,000, nice. Uh, who wants to tackle the next highest line? Uh, oh, uh, I've got uh, Detol as a gift uh, to anyone who guesses right. <laughs> and if you think I'm joking. <laughs> oh yeah, trust me, this is the last one in spa this morning, so. <laughs> uh, first person to shout it out correctly. Ah, okay, so, sorry, what's that? Japan, no, no, Italy, no. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, uh, I'm hoping that's the case. If I'm wrong, we'll be giving, oh, there we go, it is right, South Korea. Um, so let me tell you a quick story about patient 31 in South Korea. Um, you see this point over here? Patient 31, all right. Um, so patient 31 was a member of a religious cult, uh, hilariously, from uh, Shin Chunji. I know this because uh, one of my colleagues works for us from Korea uh, and is currently in uh, basically house arrest. They're in lockdown, right? Um, so patient 31 was this high priestess of a cult and um, their cult is not really, um, uh, how do I say, endorsed by the government. So they like to hide their uh, identity a lot and sort of act in the shadows. And uh, they had a lot of um, their members come out from Wuhan and pray with them together in nice closed spaces, much like this space here. <coughs> uh, and um, yeah, and effectively what happened is she traveled all around the country and managed to distribute it in record time. So what you're seeing here is really the impact of one individual's uh, complete, mm, insert adjective here, that's not nice. Um, so just recklessness, that's not good. Uh, Italy is uh, number two. Uh, anyone want to hazard a guess at number three? Iran, Iran is spot on. Okay, so. Who wants to guess what this line is over here? I hear Japan, Japan is not right. The cruise ship, quite right. This is the Diamond Princess cruise ship, right? Okay, so now can I just point out, this is the longest amount of time I've ever spent on one slide in a presentation, <laughs> but how much are we learning about the way that the virus evolves over time, right? Because we're actually seeing all the data in context together against all the other um, progressions, right? So this is a, it's a really nice way just to think about it. Okay, uh, Diamond Princess cruise ship, let's talk about this. This is a fantastic human experiment, um, and I don't approve of what happened, but it happened, so let's understand what actually happened. Um, they identified people that were sick on the cruise, um, they quarantined the whole ship. So about 2,300 people from what I understand. Total infections are sitting at 705 from that population, right? So if you think of like the maximum density that you can infect of a population is about 35% then, right? And you can see that the initial um, assessment, the number that jumped up, okay, that probably grew a little bit over time, probably wasn't quite so aggressive if we're being realistic about it. Uh, it would have spread steadily over the cruise. They just identified a handful of people. But what is very interesting, and what's different about the Diamond Princess compared to everyone else, is that um, as uh, you, every day they were checking and you were, doing, you were being tested for, do you have the coronavirus, right? Um, and what would happen is the moment you tested positive, what did they do? They took you out of the population. They took you off the cruise ship, right? So now technically you're testing positive for the virus, but you're no longer part of the population. So how is it that more people manage to get infected, right? And so the fundamental thing here is this is really strong evidence of what you would call asymptomatic spread. So you're not coughing, you're not spluttering, um, you're not running a fever, you're passing through border control from your flight from Italy with 10 other people <coughs> who will find him, um, and, and, and you're, spreading the, you're effectively spreading the virus, right? And so this is really interesting. So even while no one is coughing or spluttering in this room at the moment, I've been watching very carefully, um, uh, you could still be um, contagious, right? Which is kind of terrifying. So this is the attribute that the virus has that we don't see anywhere else. 
And this is a really nice use case just to demonstrate it in a closed population that know that they're supposed to be trying to avoid the virus, that are attempting to self-quarantine in addition to that, but still fail miserably, right? So this is what happens if you quarantine badly, right? China have kind of demonstrated how to quarantine really well. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think in terms of South Africa, our data is not officially on the repository yet, which I'm quite sad about, um, because I feel like, you know, we kind of lag behind global norms and we should try and catch up where we can. Um, okay, outbreak status. Do, do you guys mind if I run over by three or four minutes, uh, just because there's so much to talk about? Okay, cool. All right. Um, so, in terms of, um, I thought I'd do this with the ggplot. I love ggplot. I use it all the time. Uh, so, this is on a log scale, and we're looking at new infections per day. Okay, so now what we've done is we've taken the first derivative of these curves over here to understand what is the rate of change of these graphs over time. Okay, um, you're going to see how this ties back in a moment. Um, who can tell me what's happening in this chart? Um, I'm, I know I'm laboring the point here a bit. Um, this is next to useless. If I put a legend on this on the right hand side, uh, we're going to have no plotting space left because there's 80 text labels. I can shrink the labels to make plotting space. You won't be able to read them. I can put them in the chart. They're all going to overlap. We're never actually be able to dig into and explore this data set properly, right? So what do we have to do? We have to do our little D3 trick again, and let's play around with this quick. So uh, mainland China, at their peak, they were adding 6,000 cases per day, right? Um, and so, but what's interesting, so this is the change in the reporting standard. I've intentionally not smoothed these curves because I want to show you what the raw data looks like. Um, so if somewhere around here, um, at the beginning of um, February, they started implementing mass uh, quarantines. And what you're seeing is the two-week lag before the quarantines now actually start to impact. So it takes about, once it infects a population and it's uh, self-sustaining, it takes about two weeks before the actual quarantine measures that are implemented start to kick in and slow down the, the spread of the virus, right? So this is now really great. If you have a look at this, China, off a base of 80,000 odd infected people, are only adding 209 new cases a day. That's phenomenal. That is uh, kind of the benefit of living in an autocracy, if we can put it that way. Um, which, you know, I think the people that are there probably don't agree with it, but, you know, so be it. Um, this is Iran. They have now accelerated past. Uh, two days ago, it was South Korea. But all three of these countries are failing to contain the virus at the moment. Or are they, right? So this is the question, is that like South Korea three days ago, they just looked like oh, we're going to keep going up, but now they've turned down, right? So uh, in an ideal world, you want to mimic what happened with the, princess di uh, the Diamond Princess cruise ship, right? Well, they peaked at 82 cases per day, but you can see obviously their population was shrinking as well because people were being taken out of the population, but effectively uh, declined all the way down to zero, right? So that's what you want to be in. You want to be in a state of adding zero more cases per day um, so that the virus effectively goes extinct in your population, okay? Uh, cool. And then uh, the last thing that I did was I wanted to work out what was the typical growth line. So taking these kind of gradients, uh, taking what the, trajectory, uh, the trajectories are that each of the countries are following, um, let's put it all together. So uh, I just looked at the first 12 days of the virus. So let's say you inject someone into the population at time zero over there. How long does it take to get to 100 cases, 200 cases, 400 cases, 800 cases? And looking at the different quartiles, because every country is behaving differently based on their quarantine policy, right? So depending on what the country is doing to implement some sort of strategy to stop the virus uh, actually determines how aggressive the growth is or isn't, right? Um, so uh, the median is really robust. That's like, you know, the middle of the row um, sort of um, country. Uh, excellent policies are down there at the 25th quartile. So um, that's going to put you in about 12 days at maybe 100 cases. Uh, 75th quartile, 700 cases, right? Um, so this kind of, and also you can see the mean is obviously above the median here. That's kind of obvious that the distribution is bounded below, so you're always going to have a heavy tail vertically. That's not so complicated. The problem is we don't have a lot of data beyond that, so you can see how the mean kind of actually ends up pulling above the 75th quartile, and that's because there's some really, really big numbers above um, the 75th quartile. So uh, that's a little bit weird, kind of an attribute of the data. Also, uh, we don't have a lot of breakout day data for uh, countries that are like in their later stages, let's say. So it's a good way to put it. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, for me, um, if you're going to ask me, like, well, what should you be looking out for in South Africa at the moment, I'd say, well, okay, um, nothing much right now. We're in this infancy stage where we've got, like, two cases. Okay, cool. And they're all traced, and we understand the linkage between the cases. Uh, is there an outbreak here? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, but uh, we'll know in two weeks, and we'll know how we've performed in terms of our quarantine measures, right? Which, for me, is really interesting because... Um, it's difficult to know whether your policy is right or not, and at least if you draw a line in the sand, you'll know, okay, cool, the government's doing a great job. I'm going to set my expectations a bit lower, but I just want to know like, exactly where, where we're going to lie over here. Uh, cool. So I think, um, just to pull it all together quickly, uh, the mortality rates have been constant, about 3.7, maybe a little bit higher, 3.8. Um, 
the data is not super dodgy. China, I'm not trying to fudge the numbers, like take all the paranoia away. It's, it's just an ugly coronavirus. Um, the quarantine policy really matters, and educating people that have been quarantined really matters. People on the Diamond Princess weren't actually explained how to self-quarantine, how to wash your hands, how to make sure that you don't give it to other people. When footage emerged of people like walking around outside touching banisters without gloves on and enjoying the fresh air, like the, the international community was like, guys, please, like, you're actually going to make it worse. And, and yeah, and also don't go on a cruise. <clears throat> Um, oh, well, yeah, well, the other problem here is that the cruise ship technically is like, uh, I think they, they have some type of cruises that are like Blue Rinse Brigade uh, cruises. So that's actually your most susceptible population. You really don't want to be on a cruise as an elderly person. Anyway, um, the, biggest, the biggest impact um, that I've seen so far, and I, I haven't put the data up or anything else, I haven't actually had a close look at it, just anecdotally, uh, the economic impact. Uh, if you look at what's happened with the um, transportation rates in and out of China, with the way that they've um, cut the borders, um, because Effectively, countries weren't willing to import or export anything in or out of China. That complete shutdown has ground everything to a halt. Like the new iPhone is delayed. Oh my gosh, how will we ever survive? Um, and because uh, they literally shut down all production, they sent everyone home. Um, and this is kind of a feature that China have that they can do that, right? They can just mandate. Like no one leave. Like the cities are ghost towns. It's quite terrifying. Um, so even in Korea now, that they're not really allowed outside. It's heavily, heavily discouraged. Um, and so the, the impact is economic, right? Um, so if you look at the, the debt to liquidity ratio of somewhere like the United States, it's just my personal opinion, uh, given the little sneeze that they started having two weeks ago in terms of their economy with everyone raising warning flags. Uh, if you told Americans that uh, they weren't going to get a paycheck next month with the amount of debt that they live in, uh, tell me if you think that's recoverable. Um, so I think there's, there's merit to being um, concerned and being concerned enough that you take the quarantine process uh, seriously. Right, um, but you can never prevent one patient from breaking through your border, right? Because of the way that the virus operates. So logically, like the fact that there are corona cases in South Africa is actually it's inevitability, right? It was always going to happen. The question was just when. Okay, cool. It's here. Practically, what now happens? How effectively can we quarantine? And many countries have effectively quarantined for a long time. Hey, um, if you follow, um, we, uh, Macau has been pretty good. Um, there we go. Macau over almost a month have sat at 10 cases, right? So it is possible to effectively quarantine um, and, main, and, and sort of control the spread of the virus in your population. Um, the problem is, is if your quarantine measures are inadequate, you then get this massive exponential explosion, which becomes very hard to stop. And the price of actually deciding to stop it, you still pay the price for two more weeks. So yeah, these are the kind of interesting things that the data tells us. Uh, I hope that was semi-informative. Cool.